Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 88, the Mira Jelashul Hockey Journey. Sorry if I beat up your name there a little bit. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we go international, head over to Finland and begin the conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping the hockey players get really good with a stick and puck. Just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Mira Jelashuo is my next guest on the Hockey Journey podcast, and I can't wait to hear her story, because she was a hockey rock star. Here's a quick snapshot. Miss Jelashuo started separating herself by the age of 15, playing in the Premier Finnish Women's League, where she became an all-star and the team's captain while still attending high school. Here's a list of some of her accomplishments. Two national championships with the University of Minnesota, was a two-time Olympian, five-time Women's World Championships bronze medalist, enjoyed a five-year professional career before embarking on her current path, and that's in the coaching sector, where she currently is an assistant coach for the St. Cloud State University women's hockey team. Like I always do, we're going to start at the beginning and try to reveal how this young lady carved out a spectacular hockey career as a player, and now is giving back to the game as a coach. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mira Jalashuo to the show. Mira, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Well, thank you, Lance. I'm uh, I'm super excited to talk a little hockey with you. Well, thank you. And um, did I butcher you your name? How do you how do you say your last name? I, I was on pronounce. Yeah, that was pretty bad. So you say it Yalosuo. Yala Shuo. So I have Jala Shuo. Jala Shuo. Yala Shuo. Yep. Yala Shuo. Okay. Yala Shuo. All right. From this point on for the rest of the interview, you're just known as Mira J. Okay. <laughs> that, that works more than fine with me. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, uh, who would have thought that if we were told 20 years ago that the two of us would somehow get connected? You being from Finland, me from Minnesota, I'd be doing a podcast, go figure, and you would be a guest on it after a spectacular hockey career. But here we are, and I couldn't be more excited to settle in and hear your story. So if you don't mind, Mira, let's jump into the time machine, uh, head back over to Europe, and let's start at the beginning. Where did you grow up? Talk about your parents, other siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports or interests. In a nutshell, tell the listeners what it was like growing up, Mira J. Well, that's a, that's a super interesting question. And uh, I'm from a small town, so 12,000 people uh, in the in the e- eastern Finland. So uh, about an hour from the closest airport, which is a super small airport. And uh, started playing hockey when I was a sixth grader. So I think that that's... Uh, first mind-blowing thing for Minnesotans because I, I feel like in Minnesota there is a lot of pressure that if your daughter or son is not three years old and they're not on their skates they won't make it to the highest level yeah and uh, it's uh, it's it's super interesting that I uh, I always played pond hockey with my with my friends just for fun and uh, I was I was pretty good athlete, but like I said, from a smaller town, so we didn't have a whole lot of options. So we didn't have like soccer team in the summertime that we were literally just, uh, we just had a soccer ball and we went out and played played with the friends. And uh, I was super into ski jumping. So ski jumping is probably the main sport in my hometown that we uh, we have had a couple Olympians, Olympic gold medalists actually come from my hometown. So 
wow. all the younger kids who were athletic, they uh, they somehow ended up doing ski jumping and uh, then combine skiing, which is ski jumping and cross country skiing. And uh, I was uh, I was super good. Like I uh, I competed against multiple people who ended up win- winning an old Olympic gold medal, and uh, I was doing that until sixth grade. And uh, oh, wow. the reason being why I why I basically quit was that uh, I was only female and uh, I wanted a team atmosphere. So I wanted to be a part of something, something where I would be able to talk with people versus just being in my own head and just uh, just doing my own thing. So that's that's the main reason why I started playing hockey. And uh, it was my gym th- teacher who. Uh, who had talked about hockey for me because he because her uh, sons used to play hockey. So she was like, I have some gear for you. She knew that I was from a poor family. So my parents are divorced, whatever. And uh, mom is a nurse and didn't make a whole lot of money. So I was like, sure, I, I will borrow those gear and uh, I will go check out the, the hockey rink and see how I would like to play as a team. And uh, sixth grade, went to the hockey rink. And uh, I was horrible, like so bad, because the the ice is different when you go to an indoor indoor rink versus pond hockey. Sure, it's just, it's just more slippery. So I uh, I barely could stand stay on my skates. It was it was so bad, and uh, somehow uh, somehow I ended up playing. Still, I, I had fun in the locker room and uh, enjoyed the team at atmosphere and. Uh, the follow following year, I uh, I started to get better. That I I always had a passion for sports, and I would say I had the will to learn it. That I I didn't give up, even though I like I said horrible hockey player my first year, and uh, I then I ended up playing with boys for uh, two and a half years, and uh, I also played with the women at the same time, and. Uh, just slowly started to get better and better. And uh, at the when I was at ninth grade, so ninth grade is still like a junior high in Finland. I uh, I got recruited to play in uh, in the highest women's league in uh, in Finland. So I uh, which was which was by the way three and a half how three and a half hours away from my hometown. So I uh, I thought about it for like a day or so and. Uh, I told the people who contacted me that I, yep, I would like to join the team. You have a lot of injuries and uh, maybe I will get a little bit of playing time there. The only issue was that uh, I was still in junior high. So I told my mom, hey, come to the rink with me. You have to sign this one paper. (laughs) And she is like, you're like, what are you talking about? Like, because I always biked to the rink. It was only like two mile, two mile bike, bike right there. So she was like, why do you need a ride? Why do I need to be there? Like, this is your thing. And uh, <laughs> I should not have to go there. And uh, the next thing we know, I hand out this paper for her. I'm there with the GM of the club team I was currently playing with. And uh, she's like, what is what is this paper? And I'm like, well, it's a transfer paper. So you need to sign it because I'm not 18 yet. And I'm not able to do it by myself. And I don't want to fake your signature on this paper. And she, uh, she looked at me. She was so upset. She was like, how are you going to get to this town for the weekend game? Because you have to be at school during the weekdays. And I was like, I don't know yet. She was like, are you going to bike there? That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty long bike right there. I was like, I, I haven't, I haven't thought that far yet, but I'm sure that there is public transportation or something like that. And I will figure it out. And I did figure it out there. I, uh, I took a bus every, every Friday. Like I said, the bus ride was, probably four, four and a half hours. And uh, then I came back usually on uh, on Sundays or Mondays. And uh, then uh, for the for the uh, for the high school, I actually moved to that town. So I was in uh, I was in a sport high school. So obviously first time living by, living by myself, living the dream. So it's a uh, it's a very cool concept in Finland. We have that uh, the women or the young girls are able to train with the boys. So I, I was on the ice with some NHL players like Michael Kronlund and uh, Michael's brother, Marcus, and uh, some other good hockey players. So that's that was usually like from 8 a.m. until 9 a.m. Then we went to school and uh, 
in the afternoons or evenings we uh, we were training with our club team and i i really liked that concept because it was first of all it was free and it was supported by the by the school so it was part of the school curriculum that you have to go to these morning practices and uh, i think that's one of the one of the reasons why uh, why finland is uh, doing such a good job at the world stage very small population five million people it's about the same size than minnesota but uh, the high wow. school system is unbelievable if you're in a sports high school so let me interrupt here uh just to get clarification for myself because i'm a little older you know i'm 55 now so the brain maybe is not as fast as it used to be but you had a real passion for skiing early on uh you're the town that you're from small town 1200 people has uh produced a, a number of uh olympic gold medal uh, uh jumpers and stuff so you switched to hockey that was suggested to you by one of your teachers because you uh wanted to be part of a team sport and that started in sixth grade and then by ninth grade you're getting recruited to play in like the top premier uh league and you're playing practicing with boys and then the following year you get recruited to what's called you said a sports high school yep. so th that's Tell, talk a little bit about that, how, you know, um, how special is, is that what people strive for? A, I want to know how you did this in such a short amount of time, and then B, talk a little bit about the specialization training, because I agree with you, it is a small uh, country, and the Finland has produced some amazing hockey players, but have done so well on a world stage both on the female and the male side so if, if you guys are doing something right there yeah yeah i uh, everything is correct what you say there and uh yeah we we specialize kind of in hockey but at the same time like we're doing a lot of other activities just to become a better at better athlete so in the summertime for example we don't have ice so it's very rare that you're skating in uh, in May and June and July, that we're just focusing on off-ice training. And it's honestly, it's a lot of coordination. So that's, I think that that's one of the other things that's separating Finland from other programs is that it's not an overkill. We are not on the ice 12 months a year. And uh, I, I really like it. And everybody is super supportive that they're like, yeah, you should be doing other things than just playing hockey 24 seven. And I, I think that that's one of the key things for me, why I was able to climb up the ladder so quickly that I, because of the schooling system, even in junior high, the gym classes, we, we literally try every single sport you can imagine. And uh, they, they're building better athletes, athletes overall. And uh, for me to be able to recruit it, to go to the sport high school, I uh, I got invited to the U20 national team my ninth grade year. That was uh, 2004 December when I got my invite there. So I think that, that that obviously helped helped a lot to get to that sport high school. I I was super excited to get the get the invite first of all. Sure, I I when I first got into coaching, Mira, there was a. Uh, someone in the circle of people that were you know i, I kind of reached out to for some advice and mentorship uh one person gave me a dvd uh that's dating myself but it was a finland stick handling uh beyond belief or something like that ultimate stick handling in finland and it was a bunch of players in a in a gym and you're you're doing all kinds of agility stuff and jumping over things but also while managing handling a puck or a ball uh did you experience a lot of that as well off ice stick handling shooting and passing training yeah that that we did a lot of that in the in the summertime like i said we didn't have the ice available for us so we uh, we included the off ice stick handling usually during the summer months. Not not so much during the during the winter time. Like like I said, in the mornings we were on the ice, doing skills. So like I said, that was run by the by the high school people. So we didn't focus on on systems, but it was literally like 
stick handling, edge work, shooting, all all different kind of skills. And then in the afternoon or evenings, when we went to the club teams, then we uh, then we started obviously working on the on the systems. And I uh, I thought that that was uh, that was super good formula for uh, to get better. When did you uh, realize that? you were starting to get pretty good at hockey. Because again, your growth went from grade six to grade nine. You go from starting at the beginning to the to the top of the mountain almost. Uh, you know, how did you do that? I, I I think that the key thing is that like I was always humble. I never thought I was very good. So I that that was my motivation that I never was able to say that, hey, I'm a heck of a hockey player. I was always like, okay, this person is doing better at X, Y, and C, and uh, I need to get better at these things. So I think that, that was the driving force for me, that uh, I, w- I wanted to the, be the best person of myself and realizing that there was a lot of lot of things that I needed to get better at. And I, super hard worker, like every single Finnish person, is we, uh, we are very blue-collar nation overall. So we uh, we put the work in, and I uh, I would say that I trained between twenty five and thirty hours a week, and that's there is no secret sauce in my opinion. Obviously, some people are super skilled, but you still need to put the work in to get better. Can't say it any better than that, young lady. Uh, <laughs> you want success? There's a pair of work boots right next to that word. <laughs> Put them on and yep. get to work. <laughs> yep, I, I uh, agree with that. So you you're uh, you got you got an opportunity to go to the to the sports high school. Um, and when was your you you had some international some national team uh, opportunities and international play that happened prior to you going to college? Yes, so 2007 is the first time I played in the in the World Championship Games. So I was 18 at that point, and I think that I was a sophomore, sophomore in high school. So I got invited to play in the Women's World Championship Games, and I think that that kind of I I didn't know anything about college hockey. Literally, like it was over the over the top of my head. So then these school, schools started to contact me and uh, there was a couple couple of Finnish players who played in uh, in Duluth for the Bulldogs in the early 2000s when they had a lot of European players so they kind of like talk a little bit about the college experience and uh, what it is but it's uh, it was very overwhelming experience because you have all these schools talking to you and uh, they're all, all like car sales people just like me when I'm selling St. Cloud State for people like I, uh, I I have to sell the program, so it was very overwhelming for a Finnish person, and not even my English was horrible. Like I I'm a science brain, so that was the other thing that I had to get better at was English. And uh, half of the time I had no idea what these schools were talking about, but they're super excited to talk to me, and uh, they were telling me that they're gonna make me the best defenseman in the world and whatsoever, and. Uh, it's overwhelming and basically like I didn't have parents who talked English so it was just me talking to these schools as yeah. an 18 year young lady no right. not knowing a whole lot of whole lot about like life so uh lucky I was I was lucky enough to uh got it down to four programs so uh my senior year in high school so the recruiting happened a little bit later back back in the day so senior year high school I uh I took official visits at Providence, Ohio State, Duluth, and uh, the Gophers, and I, I think that that was huge for European players to actually like see the facilities and like interact with the coaches and players in person. And I, I think that that helped me sure. to make my, uh, my decision. And I, I tell the 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 gals that I get in front of that earn that opportunity as well that go on as many visits as you can because usually by the end of it they they start ranking themselves you know and one one usually will come to the top and I always just 
the, the last thing I say is what kind of experience do you want to have now for you? That's completely different because um, both of my boys, one's currently at the University of Minnesota, but you know they could still come home on Sunday. For you to to go on this next journey uh, on hockey and the, the college route, you're you're a long plane ride away. I, was that scary to you, or because you were already doing the high school thing, living away from home, uh, it wasn't that big of an adjustment. I I honestly didn't feel like it was scary for me because I I wanted to get better and I I did realize that the only way for me to really again do it fast was to play against the US US national team players and the Canadian national team players like I could have stayed at Europe and uh, be an average player in Europe but that was never my goal my goal at the end of the day was to beat USA and Canada at the world stage and be able to compete against those best players in the world. So for me, it was just exciting to get to the next level. Is that the dream of young Finnish hockey female players now is to get good enough so they can play U.S. college hockey? Is that the ultimate goal as well as playing for the national team? I, I think that it's becoming more and more popular now that we, we had a couple down years where we uh, we didn't have that many players playing college hockey. But now uh, now with the new head coach, he's really encouraging people people to go uh, go play in the in the college league and uh, go play against the U.S. and Canadian players. Once once you know that you can compete against them at the practices, that should build up some kind of confidence that when you actually put finish jersey on at the World Championship Games, you should know that, hey, I played against that girl a couple of weeks ago against practice. I was able to able to go around her, score score against her. That, that should build up confidence. Yes. And you obviously built a lot of confidence. And I, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's very common is at least here in Minnesota for girls that are excelling early in in their hockey career to to play with the boys, and I think that uh, you know you obviously had that as well, and being a defender that that helped you out. But uh, just talk a little bit about because what when you're going to this, high, I'm just curious on what what your you know your winters would be like at that sport high school. Was there was there a league or are you just training and then you have scrimmages within the, the people in the school and that's it? What was the winter uh, like there at that sport high school? Well, it's uh, you you usually train with the high school against the high school players in the morning. So that's where you do the skills. Then you go to school, but in the afternoon and evenings, you go to your club team. So the boys go, go practice with their club teams, whoever they're playing for and the the girls go play for their club teams and in Finland there is only a couple of leagues so I, I was playing in the highest women's national league so I went to practice with those females in the evenings and uh, it's, it's kind of funny to be 18 years old and you are you're training with women who can be 40 and uh, that's that's just how it works in Finland that we we are not as fortunate as, as Minnesotans that we don't have those U8, U10, U12, 15, and high school leagues for just girls, that if you're very good, you will be playing with much older players. And uh, I, I I liked it, but I also like, I, I love the Minnesota community-based hockey model model too, that I think it's very special that you can, uh, you can play with your, with your age, with the girls who are same age than you. Yeah, and it, it, it's also a great system to, you know, give all kinds of kids opportunities to try the sport. I mean, you don't have to be super passionate about it to be on a team and play. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's kind of really cool here for us to be able to grow the game like that. I'm sure that's a challenge not having those little feeder programs in Finland to be able to grow that game at the girls level. Correct. That that's uh, that's it. that's the little little issue there that in Minnesota you have uh, you have on the girls side right now A B1 and B2 
hockey and it's getting to the point that we can almost have a C level hockey just like on the boys side just for the people who enjoy the locker room life and they're just doing it for fun so it's a it's a challenge in Finland but like I said we uh, we just don't have the numbers yet it's funny that you bring you brought up the locker room a few times during this interview and I, I just remember you saying that when you switched from skiing because you wanted to get into some type of team sport and you said you were horrible at the start but it was the the enjoyment that you had in the locker room that that kind of kept you going on you know going there early on and that's important you know to to have those little things sometimes it might be a coach you know that says something to you you know and you're like okay i want to do this because that guy just said something nice to me and believed in me so let's talk a little you I mean you you you're growing up quick you you're growing up quick in high school you're you're operating more at the the college mentality but talk about your first uh, olympic experience um you know the the process of leading up to them picking the team you making the team because i'm sure that that was a process and it it wasn't <laughs> set in stone and then your tour preparing for the olympics and then when you're actually there and experiencing it just talk spend a little time on that yeah so that's a it's it's another interesting story that like i i think that people have a false expectations of the top end players that everything has been so smooth and easy there hasn't been any adversity and also people don't like to talk about the adversity but for for me the biggest adversity was that 2010 so i had played in the world championship games 2007 8 and 9 9 then we had a coaching change uh, the summer of 2009 so a new coach who uh, who takes over the program and uh, i didn't make the olympic team 2010 and super disappointed that's and it was honestly fair that i didn't make it i i was just moved to usa 2009 this the fall of 2009 and uh, i uh, i didn't i didn't play well in the in the national team events which are the biggest showcase to actually making the team the selection selection is made based on only the national team play games and i didn't play well i honestly didn't didn't deserve to make make the team so that was the motivation for me the next next four years. So, 2014, I uh, I I ended up making the team. Uh, we played the Pyeongchang Olympics Olympic Games, and that road was not easy. That I was playing super good hockey in the 2013 World Championship Games. I think that I was the top D for the Finnish team, and then uh, the following. So I graduated also the 2013 spring. So I decided that I'm gonna go to Europe to play pro and get ready for the Olympics. That I, I thought that's gonna help me to get better. So I, I signed to play in Russia. So I played in Nizhny Novgorod, which is a six hour car ride from Moscow up north. And wow. uh, I, I participated at the, all the all the national team camps and we had these four nations in Lake Placid in, uh, in November. So I played Sunday in the Russian league right away back my packs. I flew to Lake Placid on Monday, got there. I think that I got there Monday, Monday or Tuesday. We, we also flew to New York. So I had to rent a car and drive to Lake Placid. I got, I got to Lake Placid optional ice, but I was super passionate about hockey. I, I hadn't seen my best friend who happens to be a, happens to be a goalie. And she was like, Let's go shoot some pucks like old good times at college, and I'm like, sure, yeah, I will, I will hop on the ice with you. And it was literally probably 6 p.m., so 3 a.m. in Russia time. I get up there, uh, everything is going super good. End of the practice, I'm taking some one timers, and uh, then there is a trail on the ice, and my uh, my right skate got got caught, and uh, I dropped. And the next thing I was like, I can't get up anymore. That like I was in so much pain. Oh no. Then next thing I know, I'm in an MRI in Lake Placid and they're like, you need to fly back to Finland and uh, you're gonna have a meniscus surgery. I'm like, okay, not a not a big deal. And uh, the biggest thing for me was like, what what is the timeline to uh, 
for this recovery. And they were like, you will be back in a month or so. I was like, okay, that's good news. I, I will be ready for the Olympics. And uh, flew back to Finland, got the surgery. They also had to clean up something else, just like every single surgery. It never goes like you planned plan for it. But then uh, talk with the national team and I was like, what is the best or the fastest recovery road for me? And they were like, there is a little training center called Court on it, just like Lake Placid for you guys. So that's the training center in Finland. And they were like, move there for a month. And uh, you will have PT every single day. You can start skating there whenever you're ready. And I was like, sure, yes, I'm going to move there. Literally moved in the middle of the nowhere. And uh, <laughs> and I I was able to get back on the ice in two weeks. So things things were going super good. Flew flew back to Russia uh, around Christmas time. So I didn't even spend the Christmas break at home. And uh, obviously the Russian... Uh, boss was that you you need you need to play we need to win some games so uh you uh you have to put your gear on and i was literally hesitant i was like i don't know if i can play yet but we were also playing somebody who wasn't super good so i was like whatever like i can just stand there and make some passes and uh ended up playing there it, it and and i was getting better too that i i felt more confident on my knees so that was super good but then January hits and it's my I skipped the national team camp in December because I, I wasn't ready but they announced the Olympic team around Christmas and uh, I, I made the team so I was happy that I didn't have to make that camp that the, the previous camps were good enough to for the coach to say that okay you're gonna be you're gonna be playing in the Olympics and then uh, then January early on January we had a camp in Germany national team camp and again i'm super pumped to see my see my friends and like put the jer finish jersey on and uh yeah. pre pre-game warm up on the ice uh, for one of my friends i'm like hey can you can you just check me a little bit that like i just have to make sure that my knee can handle this international level hockey <laughs> what, what an idiot so the next thing she does she uh she checks me just like i ask her then I feel it on my back. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? In your like, back? I, yeah, my back. I, oh. I, I was like, you're kidding me that like this can't be true. That this is my comeback. One, one and a half months from the Olympics can't be true. Oh. I, I played the first period and it was so painful. I, I, I barely put, was able to like tie up my skates. I had a habit that I always unlaced my skates between, between the periods and, I couldn't tie my skates and I, I went to the PT and I was like, can you look at my, look at my back? Like something is super badly wrong. And he's like, yeah, you can, you can move your legs. Like there is no power on your legs. The next thing he has to go tell the coach, Hey, Mira is not able to play anymore that she hurt her back. I never told anybody like how I actually hurt my back because I was being an idiot. Like I asked for it. <laughs> and, um, uh, then again, the coach, coach did a super good job with me. He was, he was in the morning, he tried to skate me. And I was just like, I'm so sorry that like, you have been so good for me, but I, I can't skate. Like I, I will destroy our chance to win this tournament because I'm not ready. And, uh, the doctor was like, you need to get an MRI and fly back to Finland. So again, flying back to Finland, getting on that MRI machine, going, it was obviously at the national team level. You hump, you jump on the MRI machine, and an hour later, they they know what's wrong. That's that's pro hockey. And uh, the doctor comes to my room. He's like, "Take a seat." I'm like, "Okay." Like, what's what's wrong? And uh, he goes, three of your lower discs are herniated." And oh, no. the reason why you are not able to walk right now is because the one of the discs is pushing a nerve. And uh, I was like, "You're kidding me." That, uh, how long is this recovery now? And he was like, it's so, so if you're able to make the Olympics, that you can't do anything the next month and a half, that you uh, you need to be just doing recovery. And I was like, you are kidding me. Oh my God. I told him that you, uh, you can't give this information for the coach, that uh, the only thing you can say that I have a little injury and I will be back for the Olympics. That's the only permission I gave for him. And... Uh, he he kept his word. He didn't say a word for the coaches. I 
the following day I, I met with the coaches and I said, everything is fine. Like I will be, I will be ready. I will fly to Russia, Russia, the support the team there. And uh, also the Russians didn't know, didn't know like how bad my injury was that I told them that my back was hurt and I can't play. So then this Russian mentality is that I got there and we had games that we needed to win. So again, the same thing. And basically in December that you either play or you will be fired. And I knew that I'm not, we played the top team in the league. So I knew I won't be able to help the team to win those games because I wasn't physically hundred percent. So I was like, okay, I, I will do it, but can I ask for one thing? And they were like, what? I was like, our goalie can stop the puck. So can I call my best friend and, uh, can she come play these games, these, these three games we need to win? Can she come play? And uh, the boss looked at me and said, that's, a, that's actually a good idea. <laughs> so the next thing I know is that nobody else knew about what was going on, that my best friend, Nora Ratu, who also played for the Gophers, jumped on the plane and uh, she came to play those three games. I couldn't move again. I was horrible, but Nora won those games for us and uh, a boss was happy. I didn't get fired. And uh, obviously the national team also saw that I was in the lineup. So everybody thought that everything is good and no, things were not good. Like I, uh, I couldn't sleep during the night because of those, that back issue, but then uh, and ended up, ended up getting to play in the Olympics and uh, every, everything ended up working out, but there was a lot of adversity that I, uh, I had to face those, those four years and, uh, that November and December were basically for me, like, not again, that like, I will be playing in the Olympics. This is, this has been my dream since I was a kid and nothing is going to stop me. And, uh, I was, I was able to play in the, in the Olympics, Olympic games. And, uh, I would like to say super cool experience, but at the same time, like I love winning and, uh, we, we ended up being fifth, so that kind of ruined the experience for me. That like awesome two weeks, and then you blow the quarterfinal game against Sweden, and uh, again that was my motivation for the next four years, never ever again. And uh, 2018, we were able to win the bronze medal, so I was I was able to win one one medal in the Olympics, and super super proud of it. That's it's well, congratulations. That's your your story is amazing and i i love that i i get to to hear these because if i didn't start a podcast and the nora nora elliott who you coach and we'll talk a little bit more about uh your youth hockey coaching but you know we got connected there and i get to hear this cool story i mean it's awesome so uh but the one you know hockey everyone's story is different mira but everyone's is the same as well because I haven't interviewed, I didn't experience and having my kids, everyone I know, there's no one that goes through a hockey career without any adversity, like you said. And you just, at the end of it, you look at all the stats and like, oh, they had a great career. That must've been fun. And there's some tough stretches in there. And that, that was one of them at the Olympics for you. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's exactly what it is. And I, I, I I wish people would talk more about the adversity that they uh, they actually face during their career, but I I get it that some of the stuff is super hard for them to uh, to handle, and it's also the one one of the things that I always tell for my players that they're like you had to sacrifice so much for hockey, and I'm like I hate the word sacrifice, like you have to understand that it's a privilege to be part of this hockey and this hockey community that it has given me so much much more that it has taken. So I, I always say, that, listen, I had, I had the privilege to make a decision, but I didn't have to sacrifice anything that I, like I said, I had the privilege to choose between two different options. And uh, sometimes those decisions are hard, but it's part of life. Absolutely. So you, you brought up the, the, the question and the point, uh, we don't talk about the ad adversity. Uh, how did you get through it? 
who influenced and helped you to, to get through those uh, challenging uh, stretches that we all go through? Well, the, the Finnish personality is a little, little different than US. So we, uh, we actually don't like, we're not social butterflies. I'm, I'm kind of like a rare person come from Finland that I actually like talking, but I, but what comes to adversity, we don't talk about it. That we, you just kind of like hold it inside. But obviously, like I, I would say the biggest thing for me to get through the adversity was that I had a goal in my mind. And uh, when when I have when I get an idea or goal, I won't give up until I get what I want. And I, I think that that's the biggest thing for me that how I got through the adversity. Yeah, and it's you know I'm sure that you had some conversations with uh, maybe one of your parents and um, teammates or whatever. But uh, it's it is hard. I mean the mind. Hockey is a goofy sport. I, you know, athletics is, but you know, the, the, it's a, it's a game of peaks and valleys. You know, when you don't win, it, it's, it's not feeling good. But the other good thing about hockey is that you got to have a short memory because you're usually back on the horse pretty quick. Um, yes. professional hockey for women isn't obviously the same, uh, as it is for the boys and a lot of the, uh, really accomplished girls that I get in front of, they, they, they get pissed, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. cause they would have loved to have, they had the opportunity to, to make a, you know, a decent living playing hockey if they could. Uh, just talk a little bit about that. Was, was pro hockey for you more of just, uh, something to do in order to continue to be able to prepare for international play? Yeah, so the my time, so I graduated in 2013, so then 10 years ago, the only place where you could make some money was uh, in Rus- in the Russian league. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to go there, because I was like, I don't want to have a job that I want to be a full-time hockey player and take care of my body like you're supposed to and have the resources that you're supposed to supposed to have, so... I, uh, I, I would say that that's, that's definitely back in the day, like the only, only league where you're able to make some money and actually didn't have to work. So it's, it's still in the, in Finnish league, like you, most of the people, they have a job, actually nobody's getting paid. So, uh, it's, but it's, it's getting better in USA that we, we have the PHF and PWHPA, which is starting a new league in the, in the fall. So there is more and more opportunities for this young, female athletes to look forward to uh, actually playing professional hockey and making a, making a living out of it. And you're part of that board that's putting that together? Oh, I'm, I'm coaching the PWHBA, so that's, I'm there in the, in the mornings, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, they, uh, they're going to be announcing something in the next, next couple of weeks, but there, there will be a league next year. And uh, super, super excited for the future and that these girls are actually able to be like, it's their NHL, yeah. their their end goal and be able to provide for your family and uh, that kind of stuff. That's awesome. Okay, I want to go uh, spend just a little time on uh, the University of Minnesota experience because I don't know when your English started turning around, but I'm sure... Once you started university, there was a little bit of a learning curve for you, not only maybe being homesick, being so far away, but, you know, just being around so many people that only speak pretty much English. Yeah, that's like I said, I'm a science brain, so numbers are super easy for me, but language is not not easy at all. And uh, the funny recruiting story is that uh, when I started talking with these coaches, they're like, Oh yeah, you're gonna be getting a full scholarship, and uh, I had no idea what they were talking about. So I was like, "Sounds good," and uh, then I had to like translate, like, "What does full scholarship mean?" And they're like, "You don't have to pay for school." Well, in Finland, the education system is free, so I was like, "Well, good, good deal. I don't need to pay for school." And then uh, other people who had been here were like, "Well." The education is actually forty thousand dollars a year, so this is a good deal for you that you don't have to pay for it. And I was yeah. like mind blown. I was like, really? People pay for school? Like that's stupid. Like 
because I didn't <laughs> grow up with that. And it's uh, it's it's funny, but yeah, it's it's definitely like the first first semester. It was translating every other word when you're reading reading a book and you have no idea what's going on. So if a U.S. person spend an hour doing homework, I I probably spent six hours. Yeah, because that's that's what I had to do with the with the translating and uh, and it, it it ended up working working out well. And I I was a chem major, so the not at the end of the day, chemistry is very international language that all the all the letters and numbers work the same way, whether you're in Finland or whether you're in USA. So chemistry was for me the easiest major I could pick. That is awesome. The language of learning. Uh, that is so cool. Well, uh, I mean, it's, you didn't, you, it's, it's like you had to walk uphill both ways to and from, you know, school to home. Uh, nothing was easy for you. Uh, did, did hockey ever seem easy to you as a player? Well, there was always something new to learn, especially when you, when you get to the college level that like, it's, it's a whole new ball game because you're treated like a pro athlete that you're, you get a pre-scout of the other team and uh, every single week you have to learn a new system, but, but the other teams are doing. So I, uh, I always enjoyed that part. You, um, I, I don't know. You, you haven't given me really an indication of who really influenced you you know, to, to be the person you are today, but, you know, who are some of your influences and what's the best advice or some, be the best advice you were ever given? Well, uh, I, I, from Finland, I would say, uh, Hannu Saintula, who was the, the national team head coach for me, 2007 through 2009. So I, I was super young and, uh, he kind of took me under the wing and, uh, I know behind the scenes, he, he went out of his way talking to the players and just making sure that I was comfortable with the with the team because I was so much younger than the other players. So they uh, he he is somebody who I who I really respect and he also like found found me a deal with Easton and uh, got me sticks and skates. Like he he knew a little bit about my background, so he knew that I didn't have money. So he. Uh, he is somebody who I really appreciate that he went out of his way to do things for me. And uh, I would say after after that, the, the biggest influence and, and the biggest lesson I learned from him, I literally still remember it. It's like you can make mistake once, but Mira, don't make it twice because that's just being dumb. And uh, <laughs> I, I agree with that. He always let me do a mistake once. And the second time he was like, what are you doing? Like, that's already the second time in the game that you you give a breakout pass to the weak side wing, even though the strong side wing is open, something like that. And I was like, you're absolutely right. I was just being dumb there and just trying to do something I'm not supposed to do. And then I would say Joel Johnson. So JJ, who is uh, who was the national team coach for the USA last last Olympics, and he is in uh, St. Thomas right now that he uh, he is somebody who influenced me a lot as a as a person and uh, as a hockey player. Super super good coach. Uh, that he was uh, he was the assistant coach for the Gophers for three years when I when I played there. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, an amazing hockey career. It wasn't an easy one, but let's shift over now to what you got going on. You're you're in the coaching sector. Uh, you're currently at the uh, college level, but then you got some other youth and other coaching uh, gigs that you got, got going on there. Talk a little bit about that transition and how much do you like it? Because I couldn't have imagined when I retired from playing hockey that I would actually love coaching more than I ever did playing. I love playing, but this is a, and it wasn't like that at the beginning, but now that I've been coaching for over a couple decades, uh, I get so much more gratification and satisfaction out of helping others than I ever did as a player. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a great question, and I I actually started 
coaching or mentoring players 2012 so i was uh, that was between my junior and senior year in college and uh, first i was literally just i had my gear on and i was skating with the girls and uh, that was super fun like seeing the little girls and having a smile on their face and uh, them just being being little goofballs when you're on the ice with the uh it's not about hockey it's it's other questions like literally what are you gonna have for dinner and uh <laughs> Super, super fun. So I, uh, that's that's kind of my start for coaching world. And uh, I, when I, when I was in Russia, I had a, I had a lot of extra time there because we, we usually did some kind of morning workout and skated right after. So the afternoons, evenings, I had, I had free time. So I, uh, I started starting the game and just drawing up thrills and uh, watching, watching games and uh, learning, learning from the game. So that's. That's kind of when I decided that I wanna be a I wanna be a professional hockey coach, and uh, I knew that I can make a career out of it. And uh, the biggest biggest thing again, just just like for playing, you gotta have a passion for it. And uh, every single, even when I was playing pro hockey, every single summer I came back to Minnesota and uh, and I was coaching coaching young girls, not, not because I needed the money. It was because it was fun for me that I, yeah. I was already playing pro hockey. So I could have just taken the summer off and been training. But for me, it was, uh, it was a good balance yeah. between, between training and then, then getting on the ice. And I, and I honestly recommend that for all the hockey players that once you start coaching, especially women, it will make you also a better hockey player because we are, when you're coaching, you just can't say that, okay, let's do this. But with the girls, there is always why, 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 why do we have to do this? Like, what's the point of this? Yeah. And you have to think about that. And that's for me, that should make you a better hockey player too, that you're not just a robot, that you are also thinking, thinking the game a little differently when you are, when you're playing. Absolutely. So, a uh, couple more questions, then I'm going to let you go. Um, as far as from your perspective, is girls hockey in a good place today? Uh, it's it's getting better. I would say girls hockey is in a good place. I would say women's hockey. We we still have some work to do. That there there needs to be a, a, a an opportunity for women to be doing this for a living as a hockey player. So. I, I would say that girls hockey, yes, we have a great youth programs and uh, they're well taken care of. But what happens after college, I uh, I can't wait to see these these young females to sign their pro contracts and actually make a living wage. Has never happened before, <laughs> you know. Where they no, go. no, yeah. and it, it it it's a long due, but. Women's hockey is usually 15 years behind men's hockey, and uh, the time time will come. And it's it's a fun sport. It's it's a, it's a different game than men's hockey, and I think that that's that should be the selling point for the for people who uh, who we try to get to the stands, and also for the sponsors that it's a high skill game. There is there is no checking in women's hockey, so you're gonna see some awesome moves that you probably won't be able to see in the men's game. Uh, nothing is uh, more of a testament to that than the uh, Women's Junior Championships. I think that's what it's called, that gal from Slovakia that kind of inspired a, a world of female hockey players on what she could accomplish at such a young age. Tell me the story on that, on her recruiting, that you were recruiting her. Yeah, it's a it's 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 a funny story because I uh, I went to Finland over over the Christmas break to watch their uh, their pre camp for the World Championship game. So four nations: Finland, Czech, Slovakia, and Japan are uh, are playing there. So they each play one time against each other. And uh, I texted our head coach and associate head coach Brian and Chino, and I said the best part about this trip is that Slovakia has a very good O eight player. And nobody knows about her. And the <laughs> next, the next thing we know, she is on real at the U18 World Championship Games, and now everybody knows about her. So, it's gonna be an in, interesting, uh, interesting to follow her journey and who who is the lucky one who actually ends up getting getting her to come to play college hockey. Well, hopefully it'll be 
uh, St. Cloud State. Uh, I definitely <laughs> hope so. Yeah, well, it would be like winning the lottery. But yeah, I mean, she even inspired me. I, I've had many conversations with the girls that I train asking if they saw any highlights uh, of her. So, okay, last question. Much like you, I also have the opportunity to get in front of a lot of very passionate female hockey players that are aspiring to kind of be like you, maybe even a little better. <laughs> yeah. uh, what words of wisdom can you give these young hockey hopefuls, Mira, as they continue on their hockey journey? Play with passion. I, I, I think that's that's the biggest thing. Whatever, whatever you do in life, you have to have a passion for it. And I always tell this, even for adults who are like complaining about their jobs, that I hate my job. I'm like, do something that you're passionate about. And I even told that for my wife and she literally quit her job. And then I was like, wow, did I really tell you to quit your job? And she was like, yep, you did. I need <laughs> to do something that I'm passionate about. And I was like, yep, I support you. Oh, wow. So good. So, okay. Well, great, uh, great messaging, Mira. Uh, fantastic journey that you've had. And uh, I guess I just want to congratulate you on an amazing hockey career as a player. And also to thank you, Mira, for just giving back to the sport with your coaching and trying to help the next generation of female hockey players strive for greatness and become, I guess, the best version of themselves they can be, uh, not only on the hockey rink, but also uh, off the rink and in life. So congratulations and thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you for having me. And again, thank you for you for uh, coaching these young female hockey players and making them better. I'm just trying to, to make your job a little easier, but know that I'm not creating robots. I'm trying to create uh, really creative and uh, players that don't see limits or obstacles. Uh, they just see opportunities. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's anything that you got going on uh, in your life that I can possibly help you uh, with, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much for taking the time and coming on the show and, and sharing your hockey journey, Mayor. All right. Thank you. You have a great day. You as well. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the Mira Yeloshuo Hockey Journey as much as I did, and I can't thank her enough because she's the first European I've ever had on the show. Can you say sweetness? We're international now. Ha <laughs> ha! If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.